we are welcoming the multitudes tonight to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. We are still in the little exposition that we do on the life of Joseph. And uh, we are coming to the second part. And it is titled Joseph in the Pit. Joseph in the Grube. It's not a very nice title, but we will see that uh, from the pit there is always a way out of it. And we never know where we land up in the end. And the first point that I would like to make is Joseph has been sent on the way by his father. There is always a last journey. There is always a last decision if we want to get to our final destination with the Lord. And here we have um, Joseph, and he doesn't really know what is happening to him. There are completely different and higher things in the moving, in the higher realms of the spirit. Yes. And very often, people don't really take the decisions themselves. Circumstances of life take decisions for us. And we wonder sometimes where we land up in life, like in a place called Lauchringen. Suddenly we are somewhere nobody even knew five years or ten years ago of our family that such a, a place even would exist. And here we are tonight and we are not many, but we are those that love Jesus. Amen. Right. I would like to read from Genesis uh, 37 and verses 12 to 14. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the well of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now let us think about the situation. Four grown men, the sons of Bilhah and Silpah, in their forties, feeding the flocks. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been feeding flocks and uh, shepherding, shepherding flocks for years already. And here comes Jacob and he says to the 17-year-old chap, uh, uh, go, go and check on your brothers, you know. But I think behind was the, the, the father heart. He knew that there is trouble between the youngster and his elder brothers and maybe he thought, if I send him now, maybe he will grow up a little bit. He can't just be in the kitchen like I was when I was young, you know, Jacob, um, and, and, and together with his brother Benjamin, something's got to happen in this young lad's life and maybe he will get to grips with life and he won't just be a dreamer anymore, but put his heart to begin to do some work. In life, yes. Um, the flocks were not just around the corner. Um, Sechem or Shechem was about 75 kilometers away from Hebron. I mean, that, that's that's quite a quite a distance. And um, we we don't know how long it took this youngster to get there because we know he was a dreamer and dreamers they go a bit left and through the forest and then oh they see a nice rock up there which they sit on it take out the flute and play a little bit or something but he was a dreamer and eventually he got somewhere and he got lost but what happened first was when his father sent him he said three wonderful words he <coughs> said um, here am I it's the first ray of light in this young man's life. The first time we see something positive coming up. He was willing and he was obedient. And we can work with a willing heart and a heart that is Godward. And I want to read a little uh, scripture, something that happened many years later. And it was the prophet Isaiah. He had the same problem and the same character like this young man. Isaiah 6 verses 8 and 9. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, that is Isaiah, Here am I, send me. It, 
it's, it's one of the most wonderful scriptures, you know, when God begins to talk to us, um, have we got the guts to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I, I, I'm prepared to do anything. I'd be that man or that woman that is willing. willing. But Joseph, there he goes off to Shechem, knowing that most probably uh, nobody will listen to him. Nothing has changed really between his brothers and him. The relationship is still not very good. And then we read in Genesis 37, 15 and 16, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flock. The man did not ask, who, you, who are you? He, he seems to know this man. I mean, I, I can just imagine, it's a, about 75 kilometers. Every man on the road knows Joseph because of his frock. He, he had this wonderful rainbow coat on, and everybody in the whole vicinity must have known him. He didn't ask, uh, who are you? No, no, no. He immediately said, what, what are you looking for? Wandering around the field and looking a bit lost around here. No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my brothers. And then the man says, um, uh, no, no problem at all. They, they, they've gone to Dotham. And the man said, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. That is another 25 kilometers. The lad had already covered 75 kilometers. Now another 25 kilometers, that's 100 kilometers. That is from Schaffhausen via Waldshut all the way to Basel. Probably on foot. I, I, I don't know. Uh, how, how long it, 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 it took him, or, or what kind of transport he, I'm sure he didn't have a chariot with three horses in front. He, he, he might have had a donkey, or maybe a camel, um, which is, was sort of the luxury model in those days, and, uh, um, an upgrade from donkey to camel, because you sat much higher, and you sort of went like this, because they put, you know, the same legs to the front when they walked it was like a heavy sea guy there but anyway that was good old joseph now in chapter 37 verses 18 and 19 and when they saw him afar off even before he came near unto them they conspired to slay him and they said one to another behold the dreamer is coming <laughs> Behold, there comes the dreamer. Hey, just look over oh, there, what's coming over the crest of the hill over there. Hey, the, 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 the rainbow man is coming, the dreamer. Um, I wonder what, what he's been dreaming about again. And then they suddenly remember that this guy is actually not very pleasant. He's uh, squealing on them and, and bringing bad reports to his father and their hearts became dark. Let's kill the guy. Let's get rid of him once and for all. They conspired to slay him and here it says in verse 20, Come now therefore and let us kill him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. There is a bloodthirsty um, thread running through the whole history of humanity. Uh, Cain got into the field where he met Abel and he killed him because he was jealous. The same way like his brothers, the brothers were jealous of Joseph um, because he was favored of God and God reprimanded Cain. And then it goes Esau as well. Um, after he um, uh, sold his birthright for a morsel of soap, um, he got all jealous. And he had in his heart this Jacob guy, when I get hold of him, when my father's not living anymore, my mother, I'm going to kill that guy. You see? 
And, and, and so it went on and on and on. Um, Haman, the, the Agagite, in the book of Esther, he wanted to kill all the Jews. All of them. Not one must be left. And then it goes on and, and um, the, then the, the officials in, in Daniel, let's kill Daniel. Let's get rid of him. Uh, Jezebel in, was married to Ahab. Let's kill the prophet Elijah. I, I don't like this guy. He's prophesying against me and he shows me up as a bad person. Let's kill the guy. And so it went on and on and on. The Romans killed the Christians, the popes killed the, the Bible readers and so on. And then Hitler killed some Jews, six million, and then he killed five million gypsies and communists and things like this. And today Assad is killing the Syrians and the Israelis killing the Palestinians and the Palestinians are killing the Israelis and everybody is having the same spirit that dwells in man from the beginning. It's a sad, sad story. And then comes Jesus. And he says, I have the solution for world peace. And nobody listens. And then he says, and, and on top of it, I, I, I have a bonus for you. I can bring you life eternal. And they took hold of him and I killed him too. It, it's the heart of man that, that dwells no good thing in man. We have to overcome daily that burden that rests upon us. Let us cast him into some pit, they said. Now, last time I said, you know, it's like climbing some stairs. Um, we, we're doing eight episodes in, in, in the series. And last time we, we climbed the first steps. And now Joseph is on the second set of stairs and he doesn't even know it. He is completely stupid still. He doesn't know what these brothers are planning for him. He's still flaunting himself with his uh, colorful um, um, things. But the brothers, they, they, they wondered, what are we, we going to tell the father? Well, we tell him that the beasts that, that they've eaten, maybe a, a mountain lion was around, or a leopard, or maybe a bear or something. And uh, we, we just make up a story and we tell that to our Father. Yes. It reminds me of the story of Jesus um, when he was in front of Pilate. And um, these guys, these brethren of, of, of Joseph, they had no idea that at the back was the plan of God. You, you can't do anything if God is, is, is in the picture. The same when Pilate, uh, he, he says to Jesus, oh, oh, I've got it in my hands to give you life or to have you killed. <laughs> this is a Roman whim of a govern, governor and, and here is the Son of God who's created the universe and everything that is in it and this little man here, he, he says to him, I've got life or death in my hands for you. And uh, he, Jesus could have called upon a myriad of angels uh, uh, to save the whole situation for him there and then. But the plan of God was much bigger than that. And this is what Jesus said. Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except, except it be given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee has the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews wanted to kill him. Now deep inside, Pilate knew that there is something special about Jesus. And every time somebody meets with the Lord, if he's a sinner, he knows there is somebody confronting him that is different. Even if he's not present physically, but in the spirit he knows there is a greater person around here than just mere humanity. Yes, deep inside he knew. And his, even his, his wife said to, said, said to Pilate, don't kill this man. Don't kill, uh, don't, don't, um, uh, 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 what, uh, innocent blood. Don't shed innocent blood. Because this man is a good man. And um, from there onwards, it went downhill with Pilate, and eventually we've got a mountain called in the, at the Lake of Lucerne called Mount Pilatus. 
and the story goes that he jumped off the cliff and killed himself there because he was so morbid and so depressed because of what he had done to Jesus. But it's nice. We need no fear to have when we are a child of God. Because if God has a plan for us, it makes no difference if we are 120 years old or 50 years old or 17 like Joseph. If God is in it, nobody can be against it. I've got a scripture here. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in thee that, than he that is in the world. We, we, we had a car in South Africa and we had this sign plucked at the back of it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the cars used to drive up to it, read it, and then break and give a good distance between us. Nobody would ever hit us in the back because greater is he that is in me. Who's in, the, in that car in the front? There's just a woman and a, and a child or two and the things. No, 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 greater is he that is in me. And they used to break a bit in favor of respect and distance. And every time, you know, when things uh, got a bit tough for us in, in life, we always looked at that, um, that, that scripture plucked on the back of the car. Vicky, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we took courage so many times, you know, and, uh, of that scripture. Genesis 37, verses 21, 22. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid of him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben heard. I was wonder, wondering, um, what was Reuben doing there? Yeah. Then I, I thought, well, the flocks, was, they were probably so big that uh, the, the four guys is, um, from the servant girls, they had a, a flock and then Reuben and his brothers probably had another flock and he ran out of salt or, or out of sugar, uh, out of coffee or something. So he thinks he just goes across quickly to the, to, to, to the four guys from Silpa and, 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 and Bila and get a, a, you know, a little bit of sugar for the, for the coffee or something. And, but he, you know, people don't get to a place just by chance. There's always a reason why we are somewhere. There is always a godly reason. We just don't see it now. But we will see it in the end. And here Reuben comes along and he just overhears them at the right moment, in the right place, that they want to kill this Joseph. And the remarkable thing is that Reuben, he was the firstborn and he had the right of the birthright. And biblically, when, when you have the birthright, when Jacob dies, he gets double the portion of all the others. It, he, he inherited, he was going to inherit more than anybody else, but he was removed from the list as being the holder of the birthright because he slept with his, uh, his stepmother or something like that. He defiled the father's bed. So the birthright was taken away from him. And Joseph was going to be appointed one day to take the birthright and away. And here is Reuben, the man who has the most reason to get him killed, um, who has to lose the most uh, of them all. But he has a heart towards God. There is something in him that is good. Don't kill him. Throw him in the pit in the wilderness. And don't just throw him in the next pit here. Put him a little bit behind the hill there so that you, you don't even see him afterwards and then I can sneak up later on and I can get him out again and, and take him to his father. Yeah. He wanted him to be free. That he might rid him out of their hands, it says. Genesis 37, 23 and 24 And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. 
I like this phrase, it came to pass. Things come to pass because God ordains things for us. Then they come to pass. And we look upon and see the hand of God. It was wonderful. At the right moment, at the right time, he has come and has come. It came to pass. Yes. Why did he wear this blasted coat? Why, why doesn't he ever learn? He knows. It's a bone of contention when he goes and visits his brother. Hasn't he got another coat? Does he sleep in that, in that, 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 that piece of rag day and night? Doesn't he want to take it off sometime just for a moment when he goes to visit his brothers? But he's 17. He doesn't learn. He's still stupid. And here it says in the strip Joseph of his coat. Because the coat wasn't going to go with him on the journey that God had planned for him. The coat, the coat had to go. It's a symbol of pride. And it had to disappear from him so God could work with the man. For all that is in the world, John writes in the first letter, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, pride of life, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And this piece of coat is just part of it. Look at me. Um, this beautiful coat that I have. The lust of the eye. Look at it. Beautiful. Uh, look at me. My father, Jacob. Oh, I don't have to work. He feeds me every day. I sleep in his tent without any problems at all. And then on top of it all, the pride of life. I have dreams. Yes, I have dreams. Things. It's like when, when Eve was tempted, you see, oh, she saw the fruit is beautiful. Oh, it's nice to look at. And then she says, oh, yes, I'm a little bit hungry, you know, uh, the lust of the flesh. Let's eat a little bit of it. It didn't end up very well for her. Yes. You can become like God. You can be wise like God. Yes. Same with Jesus when he was tempted in, in the wilderness for 14 years. Oh, yes. Why, why don't you make um, a bread with these uh, stones here? You know, you're hungry. Oh, yeah, lust of the flesh. You know, just feed yourself. There's no problem at all. And then lust of the eye. Uh, look what, what's happening here. Look at all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give it to you. Just look at them, how beautiful. They're full of gold and silver and everything. You can just have it. Just bow down before me. No. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, in the end, jump off the pinnacle of the, of the temple. And everybody will know who you are. Absolutely famous. And pride will take over. And our question is very simple. What about our own cloak of many colors that we seem to carry around with us? Um, have, we, have we really laid it down? And have we um, decided that uh, we're going to deal with all the pride that uh, has brought us a little down in life? When, when are we going to take the coat off? Just leave it at home or just give it to somebody else to wear? And then God can work in us even mightier than what he has done in the past. And that's the message I would like to leave with us tonight.